Medical professionals of Reddit, have you ever had a patient so lacking in common sense you wondered how they made it this far? If so, what is your story? Story one, working midnight in the ER. Family brings in a four-year-old at two Amish. I ask them what is wrong. Them, ask him, the four-year-old. He said he needed to see a doctor. Me. Did he say anything was wrong? Them, no. He said he needed to see a doctor, so brought him. A quick back and forth that firmly establishes that they actually showed up in the ER at 2 a.m. Purely because the four-year-old said he needed to see a doctor, and they don't know why. Me, to child. Why do you need to see a doctor? Kid, the doctor has suckers. Me, to be clear, it is the parents who lack sense and not the kid. Story two. Had an 18 or 19-year-old girl come in my ER with some complaint that required an x-ray. It's standard that we do a urine pregnancy test prior to imaging on any female of childbearing years. She insisted she'd never had close relationship, and there was zero possibility of pregnancy. We did the test anyway, and it resulted that she was pregnant. We did a blood pregnancy test to confirm the result, since she insisted she couldn't possibly be pregnant because she'd never had close relationship. That was positive, too. We gave her a few minutes to herself to figure out what the hell happened. And when I returned to check on her a short time later, she asked me if she could get pregnant even though her boyfriend didn't go all the way in. She 100% believed that long as his banana wasn't entirely in her, it didn't count as close relationship. It took nearly a half hour of explaining reproduction to her for her to understand that whether it's halfway in or all the way in travel. Story three, not a personal experience, but one from a colleague of mine. I only saw the pics. So this 60-something-year-old suffers from an acute complication and gets a pacemaker to solve the problem. Everything goes normally, and as planned, he recovers. Every care and meds that he needs to take are prescribed, explained, and medical appointments with a cardiologist, erythmologist are scheduled so that he may get the follow-up he needs. The man then proosts to never show up to any appointment and never answer any calls from the hospital to know of him and reschedule. This went on for around three years, until he shows up without former warning and asks to talk with the doctor that did the procedure to put his pacemaker. People are weirded out, but seeing that on that day the doctor was present, and this patient was in clear distress. They talk to him and manage a couple of minutes to have the doctor check on him. Inside the appointment room, the doctor takes notice that this man is wearing a bra inside his shirt. The man explains he has been wearing his daughter's bra for three months after his problem got worse. The shirt is asked to be taken off, and there he stands. The shirtless man wearing his daughter's bra, showing off the pacemaker, that should have been kept inside his body, dangling outside of it, being holed by the left bra cup with a big infected open wound above it with the pacemaker lead still inserted onto his veins and connected to his heart. Nobody has any idea how the man let that situation come to be or how he didn't pass away of sepsis or any other health problem that may appear for that matter. Three years later comes to the hospital looking for help, wearing his daughter's bra for three months to serve as a holder for the pacemaker that got out of his body from his infected open wound. Story four, I am a dermatologist in India. As is the culture here, people eat with their hands, and almost all of our curries or even other dry side dishes have a lot of turmeric. It is common knowledge to anyone born and brought up in India that this means the nails of your dominant hand, statistically the right hand, are going to be yellow stained because we have seen this happen since our childhood. Usually this wears off in about a day and a half if you wash it a couple of times. Cut to the first patient in my OPD. A young girl in her early 20s. Very anxious. Me. What brings you here today? P. Doc, my right hand fingernails keep getting yellow discolored. Me. Only right hand? P. Yes. And only after meals. Me. Um, do you eat with your hands? P. Yes, always. Me. So, you know it's just turmeric, right? P. Yes. But can you make it stop happening? Me. For God's sake, use a spoon. P. So, you mean there is no medicine to make it stop? Me. And C. Me. No. This might hit home more with people of South Asian cultures or people who habitually eat turmeric cooked food with their hands. Anyway, for a grown peach person to complain of, this was just well surprising and a little ridiculous. Story 5. I work in veterinary medicine, and clients are absolute idiots who are convinced that they are the smartest people in the world. It is amazing that pets actually manage to stay alive. People will believe just about anyone else over the advice of their veterinarian. Their breeder, their relatives, their lawnmower, the person bagging their groceries. I had a client blind their cat with tea tree oil because they read about it on the internet. Clients change their pet's medication dose for whatever reason. That's really fun when it is insulin. Not follow post-op instructions causing their pet to pet to eviscerate itself or blow the knee we just repaired. Feed their dog candy roast with garlic and onions as their bland diet for guy upset. Heck, last week I had a client scream at me because we didn't give her an exam room with a view. We don't have exam rooms with outside windows. Story 6. EMS here. Had a diabetic in his 30 to 40s who refused to take insulin since 2012. It was 2020 at the time. 
When I took his blood sugar, is only read as high, meaning it was over 700 for glucometer to not read it. Upon seeing this, he asked me if that was high and then went, is this cause of all the ice seam I ate? Played Facebook Messenger video with his girlfriend the entire time. Met him later on the parking lot after he got discharged. And it took this man less than 50 paces from the ER door to rip off his bandage covering his IV and play with the IV wound until it started bleeding all over the place again. Knocked on our ambulance door and asked for a band-aid to fix it. We had to walk him back into the ER and bandaged his entire arm with gauze so that hopefully, by the time he got it off, it would have clotted enough for him to not end up exsanguinating himself. Story 7. Uh, my wife is an anesthesiologist. When training junior doctors, one of the things she has go reinforce over and over again is that you never leave suites unattended in an unsecured area in a hospital, even for a moment. Because some people see suites and think, hmm, fun, and take them even if they don't know what they are and they just raided a trolley or picked up a syringe off a bedside table. And then because the suites used for anesthetics in hospitals are quite serious, those people quite likely end up dead or vegetables. And this has actually happened more than once in hospitals she has worked in. Story 8. I have heard a story about a patient on whom it was impressed that she couldn't miss her fractions of radiotherapy if she was busy. And to inform us if she couldn't make the appointment, she couldn't make it. So she sent her twin sister to receive the radiation therapy in her place. She answered yes to all the ID questions. Had the same birthday, etc. It was noticed when radiographers had trouble matching her to the CT because the CT was of a person who had undergone a mastectomy, whilst the patient still had both breasts. This many years later is told to new staff during training about the importance of ensuring correct identification because you would be stunned the number of people who try to skip the queue. The number isn't high, but it isn't zero. Story 9. ER nurse with seven years experience. The list is nearless endless. People with massive burns because they smoked in bed is not as rare as you'd think. But the one that got me the most was a guy who came in for chest pain and fatigue. EKG revealed he was having a really bad heart attack. Activated or cath lab for emergency stents to hopefully save the guy's life. They almost always access the patient through the groin for the procedure. So one of our jobs in the ER is to shave the patient's groin to prep them for cath lab. We get the clippers out. We don't use actual razors anymore. And informed the guy we needed to shave him. He refused. No problem. We will let cath lab do it once he's knocked out. Nope. Guy refuses to sign the consent for the stents because he doesn't want his pubes shaved. After trying to educate him, pleading with him, and contacting every goddamn lawyer the hospital has, the guy signed himself out AMA and went home. He would rather pass away than have his curlies shaved. We looked up his address, and we weren't the closest hospital, so if he passed away at home, medics would take him to a different hospital. Doughty survived the day. Story 10. I used to be a medical oxygen tech, mostly doing in homework. One guy was on such a high concentration that he would have drawn nearly zero oxygen from breathing regular atmosphere. This required two heavy-duty machines hooked up in tandem just to keep him barely alive. This was explained ad nauseum to him and his wife with full signed documentation of every conversation. They'd shut one machine off because they decided it was too loud. He'd take his mask off because he decided it was too cold. She would unplug the hose if she decided it was in the way. So on and so on, literally everything you could think of that would restrict or cut off his oxygen intake. Then they would panic and call our emergency service when he started to have a reaction to no oxygen intake. I lived not even five minutes away, right beside out EMS fire station, and the call would always come to me to fix the machines at random times of the day and night, three, seven days a week. They refused to call 911 because they didn't want to make a scene. This went on for ages, well over 18 months, until he was having trouble sleeping one night and shut the machines off before going back to bed. It's been years, and I still see the wife around town. She always glares at me as if I'm the one who terminated him. Story 11. I don't know if cleaner in a hospital counts, but this one time I got to work early on a Saturday morning, and we immediately received a request for help from the ER and got sent over by my boss. When I got there, the first thing I heard was yelling from this guy behind one of the curtains. He was shouting at the nurses, don't touch my banana, and I didn't use any sweets. Then I smelled iron in the air, and then I found out there was blood all over the hallway, handprints and blood against the wall. Almost the entire floor was covered in blood with actual puddles in some places. What happened? The guy pulled out his catheter causing arterial bleeding and decided to run away from the nurses who were trying to help him. It seems like he lived through that. I never seen that much blood before that day nor after. Story 12. Work at a vet clinic. We get a lot of this sort of thing, oftentimes with diabetic patients. One of the worst I've seen was an older owner come in with their extremely overweight diabetic dog. Owner says the dog has been slow, tires easily, and has been flopping around, which is odd for her. Doctor checks her blood glucose, and it is so high, it is literally off the charts. Normal blood glucose for a dog is around 100 or so. This dog was beyond 1,000. We asked the owners how it got so high. Was she eating? 
clearly she was because she was obese. Were you giving her the insulin? The owners proceed to say that they think she's probably fine without it. She's a strong and hearty dog. Ma'am, your nine-year-old 80-pound Dalmatian is currently half alive on the floor because you don't give her the insulin. How they kept that poor dog alive that long was astounding. Story 13. Optometrist here. Patient booked in for an emergency appointment with a raging red eye. Clearly very painful. Look under the microscope and the cornea is really not happy, wobbly reflexes, haziness, the works. Me, what happened? Patient, it's my niece's wedding this Saturday and I wanted to tint my eyelashes to match my hair and the color scheme of the wedding light blue, so I used the same dye for both to match the color. Me, does that hair dye contain ammonia by any chance? Patient, I think so. Do you think my eye will be better by Saturday? Will it match the color scheme? Me, unless you can convince then to change the color scheme to red, no. Edited because I read a comment about healing crystals, and now I remember a story from a colleague. Patient attends a routine test, complaining of gradually reduced vision, which turns out to be due to cataract. My colleague offers referral for surgery. No need, exclaims the patient. I know what I need for this. I have lapis lazuli at home. Six weeks later, came back for the referral. A second edit for remembering the first story that made me question my sanity. Elderly patient attends with concerned family members because the patient ran over a pop-up tent in the side of the road that the telephone engineers used to protect themselves from the rain. Luckily, no one was hurt as the worker was on lunch. Worried as to how the elderly driver missed seeing a large red and white tent in the middle of the day, it was then that the elderly relative admitted to having spent the last three years driving from memory. Story 14. Not me, but sibling. I don't think he'd mind me sharing the story just on the off chance it prevents someone else from making this mistake. Lots of surgeons have a similar story, but thankfully this one doesn't end in someone's death. Parents claim their child hasn't eaten anything before surgery, as they were carefully directed. Turns out they thought the surgical team was just being cruel to their child. And when she said she was hungry that morning, they detoured on their way to the surgical center and got her a full southern breakfast. She oh no near passed away aspirating biscuits and gravy. I've rarely seen my brother so angry and disgusted. Somehow biscuits and gravy looks even more nauseating the second time around, and he was just recounting what had happened. I have no doubt he tore a strip off the parents once their five-year-old was stabilized, and they probably still felt justified and angry at the surgeon for telling them what they could and could not feed their child right before anesthesia. ETA. The parents did in fact feel justified and hard done by, although a fake, they didn't express anger at my brother. Knowing him, they didn't get a word in edgewise. Definitely no acknowledgement or realization that they could easily have terminated their own child or that they'd made a bad decision. I remember they were annoyed by her whining for food. Story 15. I'm in the ER. So many stories. The one that left me dumbfounded was a woman was brought in by her sister for pelvic cramps, amenorrhea, for three months. Lo and behold, she's pregnant. Sister informs me that she sleeps with the Brazilian construction workers building the condo complex next door. I ask if they have any questions. The patient asked me if her baby would come out speaking Spanish. After a long pause and her sister staring at the ceiling, I told her, no, because they speak Portuguese in Brazil. Patient seemed relieved and the sister hustled her out of the ER before I could discharge her. Story 16. Lady brings her baby into the ER with a rectal temp of 103. Kid's tacky as hell and looks like cow. Refuses all medications. Says she doesn't believe in them and wonders why her herbal tea, she brought a jug of it, isn't working. Wants us to just check her out. Thinks a children's emergency room just checks them out. Try to explain why the kid needs an NSI ad. Keeps refusing. Says she doesn't know what's in it. I bring up that fact she had her kid in a hospital and that she recovered medication herself. IV, epidural, etc. Doesn't budge. Only concerned for herself. Told her that when the kid has a seizure or goes unresponsive and you call 911, you can expect the medics to give the kid everything it needs regardless of whether you like it or not. Only when the doc threatened to contact social services for child endangerment and abuse did she start to listen. For like five whole seconds, left against medical advice. People like this exist and breed. Story 17. As a pharmacist, everyone who comes in to buy homeopathic nonsense, especially for serious things. Once a lady came in with a prescription from the dentist for some heavy antibiotics and painkillers due to an infection that threatened to damage the jawbone. When I asked if she knew how to take them, she went, oh, I'm not going to take those. They'll go right into the garbage. But I gotta buy them so that my dentist is happy. I'll rather stick with insert name of homeopathic nonsense here. Instead of poisoning me with some devilish chemicals. Throughout the years, I've learned to just shrug and accept those Darwin Award candidates instead of arguing with them. Just infuriates me when I see that they've got children or in pets. Story 18. I work in orthopedic rehab. Had a patient with a common fracture of the wrist the doctor sent over since she was inexplicably getting stiffer and stiffer. I spent 17 sessions with her, 40-ish minutes each one, one time. Instead of just bending her wrist, she would contort her entire body. 
She had a career, married, raised kids, and seemingly functional adult. I tried everything to have her actively use her muscles to move her wrist. In front of a mirror, videos of myself doing the exercise, her doing it, and trying to spot the difference of moving your shoulder versus your wrist. The last time I saw her, I even strapped her arm to a chair, and she didn't understand she was just trying to move her wrist. I will never understand it. Story 19. I work in clinical research at a hospital. Basically, for patients who have cancer and don't have other standard of care options, clinical trials, experimental treatment, are a viable option for many. Some people have a negative view of research, but it's highly regulated and not as scary as it sounds. We go through the consent form with this patient, who has a history of candy abuse. We don't know everything about this new medication, but one thing we do know is that using candy while taking this candy will make your heart explode, in layman's terms. This patient promises they're off the sauce and that they totally won't do candy while they're on the trial. Two weeks later, they relapse and, well, you can figure out the rest of the story. Story 20. My brother did a rotation in an ER before med school. Paramedics brought in a man with a lacerated neck. He was drunk and fell into a fish tank. His drunk buddies called 911. When the paramedics arrived, they realized his drunk friends had put a very tight tourniquet around his neck to stop the bleeding. Edit. I texted my brother to remind him about it. It happened almost 20 years ago. Apparently, it was worse than I remembered. The guy and his buddies were doing drunk WWE. He had a two-inch glass shard stuck in his head. In addition to the neck laceration, dude came into the ER with no idea the glass was there. Four different firefighters had to hold him down as he screamed sexist remarks at the female doctor. He said when they removed the glass, blood shot about 10 feet in the air. My brother, at that point, silently noped the hell out of medicine. He went on to attend Berkeley Music School and is living his best life as a musical producer and engineer and is not arguing with rednecks about whether or not there is a glass shard in their head. Story 21. Peds Nurse. The things that come out of parents' mouths daily is mind-blowing to think they are responsible for the welfare of babies and children. Two days ago, I listened to a conversation between the ICU doctor, a dad who insisted that his newborn, his second child, needs to be given water, tap water, in addition to his formula, because the human body is made up of mostly water. So how is a baby supposed to survive with no water? That's what they had been giving the baby at home. We figured out the cause of the baby's electrolyte imbalances. Another parent brought their kid in who was severely underweight and had a G-tube for feeding. Upon further discussion, the parents said when the baby cries or seems gassy, they just open the tube and hold him over the sink, and once all that extra stuff comes out, he stops crying and feels better. They were feeding the baby, then immediately letting all the formula in his stomach run down the drain before he could digest it. Unrelated, but gives a little context. The child's full name was also a Star Wars character. Story 22. Dentist here. Once a stressed receptionist asked me to help her interpretate a call. I thought maybe the patient was speaking some foreign language. No. She just wanted me to confirm that the patient was asking for his property back that we took from him last year. Last year actually being four years ago, but I guess time flies. And his property being a tooth we sent to grind into slides for analysis. While explaining that it was impossible for us to return his tooth, he started going on about his rights and his property. When I tell people to move their jaw to the side, they always ask which jaw. Actually, not everyone, only adults. Children get the assignment. Sm Story 23. I was in my last year of internal medicine residency, spending a month covering nights at one of our local hospitals. A nurse paged me around 10 p.m. with the message, can't place Foley in PT in room XX. On my sign-out list, it said the patient was a approximately 70-year-old man admitted for advanced heart failure, and needed the Foley catheter to track urine output while the team was trying to diurese the fluid off of him. I head over to the ward this patient was on and asked the nurse what the issue was, and she said I just needed to talk to the patient about it. Okay, odd, but whatever. I stroll into the room and meet a pleasant, older man sitting in his bed. The conversation immediately went, weird. Me, so what sort of problem were they having with the catheter? Were you having a lot of pain with it or something? Patient, oh no, nothing like that. They were just putting it in the wrong hole. Me, the wrong, huh? I'm not sure I understand. Patient, well, you know how every guy has their pee hole and their hole? They were putting it in the wrong one. Me, sir, I'm going to need to examine your banana. It turns out this guy had, which for his entire life, he had thought was just how a banana looks, because that's what his mom told him as a child. He literally had an accessory hole in his banana and just thought, yep, that's how a banana works, a pee hole and a hole. Story 24, I'm a vet. A few years ago, I had a client bring his young cat in complaining of lethargy. Besides being a bit underweight, the physical exam was unremarkable, so I asked more questions about the cat's diet. Me. What do you feed the cat? Owner. Online trendy raw food brand. Me. How is his appetite? Does he finish what you feed him? Owner. Yes, he always eats everything. Me. How much do you feed him? Owner. One half cup. Me. Once or twice daily. Owner. Once every three or four days. Me. You only feed your cat twice a week? Owner. 
I believe in a more natural feeding approach, and based on my research, that's how often cats eat in the wild. This owner was slowly starving his cat to death, based on some cockamamie idea he'd made up watching National Geographic. I had to explain to him that domestic cats are not tigers, and that small wild cats eat 10, 20 small meals daily. Surprise, surprise, the cat's lethargy and weight improved with regular feeding. Story 25. My wife used to work at an urgent care in an undereducated community. I'd guess most of her patients would have you wondering how they made it to adulthood. Some notable patients. The guy who, after learning he had diabetes, vowed to make a life change and replace all his soda with Gatorade. Women who don't know anything about vaginas or menstrual cycles. The people who come in with a history of heart attacks and chest pain that feels like a heart attack, but I know my body and it's not a heart attack. It was always a heart attack for guys with gross hygiene related people who did their own research. The parents who didn't get their normally not complainy teenage daughter medical attention when she was screaming in pain. After finding out she had appendicitis, they took her home instead of taking her to the ER. Her appendix ruptured that night. Bonus. My kid was in the hospital and sharing a room with another patient. This kid was morbidly obese and was elbow deep in a family sized bag of potato chips. The doctor came in and really gave it to the mom. Your kid has kidney failure and he's not supposed to be eating salty foods. Your kid has a major condition and you've missed the majority of his appointments. Story 26. I overheard a conversation between a nurse and a doctor and a patient in the ER. They were trying to figure out if he was very stupid or has a head injury. It was both hilarious and sad. He kept telling them that he was there for a hurt leg. He couldn't explain why his leg was hurt, how it was hurt, how he got there. Nearly anything, I heard them taking in a hallway to each other. The nurse was convinced he hit his head. The doctor said, no, he is just an idiot. Turns out the doctor was right. They go a hold of the guy's wife. She basically told them in the hallway he's always this dumb, and if she leaves him, he would get lost in his own house and starve. Edit. It sounded like his leg was visibly injured or swollen. But when asked what happened or how does it feel, he gave nonsensical idiot answers. Not like slurring, but in a regular idiot voice. It, it feels hurt. I was talking to Jimmy and we were doing our usual work and my leg hurt. Doc, did something happen? What is the work? Him, something always happens. You know how it goes. I just want my leg fixed. Story 27. I've been a firefighter for a very long time. One of my most recurring thoughts is, how did this person survive to adulthood? I had an elderly patient at around 2 a.m. The conversation went like this. What seems to be the problem? I don't feel good. Okay, what specifically are you feeling? I don't know. I just don't feel good. Are you on any medications? A bunch. Hands me a list. Have you been taking your meds like your doctor told you? No. When was the last time you took them? A few days ago. When was the last time you ate? A few days ago. Have you been drinking water? No. Have you been drinking anything? Pepsi? Okay, so you haven't eaten or taken your meds for at least three days, and you've drank nothing but Pepsi for three days, and you don't feel good. Another common issue is people having absolutely zero idea what their medical history is, what medications they take, or why they take them. Do you take any prescription medications? Oh, yeah, a bunch. Which medications do you take? Oh, I don't know. There's a lot of them. What do you take them for? trying to get a sense of their medical history. Oh, a bunch of things. Are you a diabetic? Heart issues? Breathing issues? Cancer? No. Can I see your medications? Here. Hands me their weekly pill box. I need to see the prescription bottle. I don't know what these are just by looking at them. Where are the bottles? I don't know. Story 28. Not me, but my ex-wife works as an endoscopy nurse. People have to use laxatives because they have to be clean for the doctor to be able to see with the camera. With the laxatives, they have to drink a lot of fluid, three, maybe four liters total IARCO, about three quarters gallon to a gallon. Some people just don't do it because it tastes bad. Some people do laxate, LOL autocorrect said lactate, but still eat. Some think the doctor just won't notice. Yeah, Margaret, they won't notice that your colon isn't empty when they go in there with an HD camera. They just don't understand why they do it, even though everything is explained by the doctor. And they get brochures and a link to the website via email. And believe me, I've seen the brochures and website. An average eight-year-old could understand. Also, a funny story from her. There was a teenage boy brought in with a dildo stuck in his butt. He didn't need surgery, but they did have to use some tools to get it out of his rectum. After the procedure, he apparently asked for the dildo back because it was his sister's. Answer was no, it was cleaned and they have a trophy cabinet. Story 29. In my country, third world country, in the fifth semester of medicine in some universities, you're sent to any village in the country to do a mini rural for about two weeks before the semester starts. It was my first experience in an ambulatory, and to put in perspective, not even the private hospitals here has the medical equipment or even the proper medical supplies. So you can guess how it is around where I was sent that had a population little over 3,000 people, and most of it are low to practically poor social class people. Anyway, the thing that most surprised me around there was the fact that almost all of the pregnant, and this is the worst thing, Girls were about 12 to 14 years old, 
I'm telling you that of the 127 pregnant women that came in to get checked, the average age was about 15.7 years old. Obviously, most of this girls got assaulted, and for not surprise of everybody, the other half were in consensual relationships, mostly with guys of the village from ages from 12 to 17. If I keep going with all the things I saw in those two weeks, I could write a book, but just to say, the expected lifespan of the people around there was about 51 years old, really, really rare, taking in accommodation all of the genetics pathologies this people have developed and the amount of little to none health care around there, where the birth rate monthly in just that ambulatory was of 12, all under 18. Really crazy to think how far they've come. Sorry for the English, not my first language. Story 30. Pharmacist here. Two come to mind, but I'm sure there are plenty more I'm not thinking of. Woman comes in claiming her medication was making her vomit. Says she can't remember what it is called. I look up her profile and there is nothing recent, just one-off antibiotics and antifungal from almost a year ago. I asked her if it was over-the-counter and she said it was. She pointed me to the monostat cream. I thought it was incredibly strange that a vaginal cream was making her vomit, so I asked how she had been using it. She was taking it by mouth. She says she would fill the plunger with the cream and shoot it to the back of her throat and swallow it so she wouldn't taste it as much as putting it directly on her tongue and swallowing. Another time my co-worker, another pharmacist, got served a lawsuit while I was there. The patient suffered a fall and concussion and claimed it was because her lisinopril, blood pressure medication, was increased from 10 milligrams to 20 milligrin, and she was not informed and passed out. She was suing the pharmacist, the pharmacy, her doctor's office, and the doctor themselves. It eventually came out in early discovery that she was at a rave and had a BAC of 0.18 THC and MDMA in her system. The case against the doctor's office, doctor, and pharmacy itself fell apart right away, so she went all in on trying to sue the individual pharmacist. The pharmacy's POS system confirmed that she checked, I declined pharmacist consultation at this time, so the case was eventually dropped. Story 31, paramedic, and had this call while I worked on a rural fire EMS service. Call came in for allergic reaction. Arrive at a rural farm and find the PT in the kitchen on the ground, wheezing. Husband says she took sulfa, which she's allergic to, and after grabbing her BP, we hit her with epinephrine same as an EpiPen, and Benadryl. Her breathing improves, and she starts to be able to answer questions. Me, so you're allergic to sulfa? PT, yummy. And you took sulfa? PT, yummy. Was it mislabeled or in the wrong bottle? P, no. Me? T, me. Was it your husband's prescription? P, no, it was for our horse. Me. Was, wait, did you say a horse? You took sulfa prescribed for a horse? PT. Well, I only took half me. You only took half because a horse is much larger than a person, Pete. Yummy. Okay. Were you intentionally trying to hurt yourself? PT, no, of course not me, but you know you're allergic, right? Pete, yeah. I just have a cold and thought it would help me breathe better, me. So you took horse sulfa, which you're allergic to, because you had a cold and thought it would help your breathing. P, I took half a horse sulfa, me. Sorry, half. Gotcha. Let's go to the hospital. Story 32. When I was an intern posting in the obstetric department, I saw a 42 YR old pregnant woman who came for an antenatal checkup. This was her seventh pregnancy, and she had only one living child. So she had five pregnancies previously, which failed, three spontaneous abortions and two stillbirths. The sixth one was high risk too, and she had to get cervical circlage done. They stitched the cervix because it is too weak to actually hold a baby in till term. When the obgen asked her why she would put herself through pregnancy again instead of being content with her daughter, she replied, my in-laws want us to have at least two children. Biggest Pikachu face moment in my life. Story 33. Ophthalmology surgery tech glaucoma patient in her late 50s going blind despite drop therapies for the past six months. Pressure is consistently in the 30s and 40s. I ask her if she's using her drops regularly twice daily and she says yes. I ask, politely as I can, if she's missed any doses in the past month. She says no. I ask if she's using them properly and she gets super offended, Ask me very rudely. Do I look like an idiot to you? I say no, but I just need to be sure. Sometimes patients think they're doing it right, but they can easily miss. Can you show me how you use your drops? She takes out her drop bottle, gives it a good shake, so far so good, looks up at the ceiling, also a good sign, opens her mouth and swallows two drops. I got in trouble, but my OD backed me up and told her that's the stupidest thing he's ever seen in 25 years. She cried and said we were bullying her, and the drops burned her eyes so she didn't want to put them in there. Since eyes, ears, nose, and throat was all connected, why did it matter where she put them? This is not how glaucoma therapy works. She needed a shunt implant, and we were able to save about 30% of her visual field. But yeah, drinking her drops and going blind. Story 34. Not a medical professional, but was pregnant and attending parenting classes at the local hospital with my partner. One of the first classes included a tour of the pediatrics area and a detailed explanation of everything that would happen on birthing day. 
The nurse showed us some teeny ID bracelets and explained they put one on each of the baby's legs because sometimes they fall off. Cue one of the future fathers, totally freaking out. None of us had any idea why until he bursts out with, I didn't know they could fall off. Nurse carefully and gently explained that she meant the ID bracelets, not the baby's legs. Story 35. Respiratory therapist here. I was working in the ER one night, and we have a prison not far from the hospital I was working at. We had a prisoner come in one night, and the doctor asked me to get an EKG on him. I went into the room, did the EKG, and gave the results to the doctor. I asked the doctor why he was here as the prisoner was acting okay and didn't appear to be in any sort of distress. The doctor told me he was here because he shoved a flex pen up his banana. The doctor asked me if I wanted to watch the pen being removed. I proceeded to return to my office. The next night I worked. We had a different prisoner come in for the exact same thing. Story 36. I'm a medical professional, but I have two really good ones from my ex fiance Laugh at me all you want. This relationship was not my proudest moment. One, at our baby shower for my son, he asked if we were going to pick any or Audi. I looked at him like he was insane. He started getting angry and just repeated the question louder until I shushed him and took him aside to explain to him that we don't choose how the belly button looks. It just happens too. He had really bad eczema and went to a doctor for it who suggested oatmeal baths during flare-ups. He bought a couple boxes of Quaker Oats maple brown sugar and would dump then entire box packet by packet into the tub. It was a couple weeks before I found the wrappers and questioned him about it. He told me, angry again, that he wondered why he was so sticky after getting out and why the flipping literal brown sugar was making his open wounds fester. I explained an oatmeal bath is not flavored oatmeal and that he had to buy either plain oats or actual oatmeal bath packets. He was furious that I expected him to just know better. When I asked him why he picked maple and brown sugar, he said he didn't want to smell like strawberries or peaches after his bath. After our son was born and we had broken up, thank God, my son also had some occasional eczema, but not nearly to the same degree. The pediatrician recommended oatmeal baths, and guess what this mom bought? He said he remembered the last time when he picked my son out of the sink and the towel stuck to him. When I started to scold him for being so stupid, he looked at me like I was the idiot and told me he only used one packet since we were still bathing the kid in the sink instead of in an entire tub. Story 37. Okay, so not a medical professional, but hear me out for a second. I work in a gym and recently had a client come in for an induction, basically walk through the gym, design program based on goals, needs, and physical capacity. The client, in her late 70s, has a shoulder injury, which the physiotherapist has said, the rotator cuff is barely attached. Client has been suffering in severe pain for years and hasn't been able to use that shoulder and refuses to go to the doctor as she doesn't want to see a surgeon, doesn't want surgery. I've echoed what the physiotherapist has said and have refused to do any upper body exercises because of how bad the injury is. The client would rather live in severe pain than seek necessary medical treatment and only takes pain relief medication when the pain is intolerable. Story 38. Watching a woman come into our ER. Off and on over the course of a couple of years to have her cockroach bite on her ball treated. It was ball cancer that she refused to accept despite many efforts and involving her family. Complete denial. Each visit, the bite grew and grew until one day she stopped coming in. I still cannot fathom her reasoning for not letting her brain accept it as anything more and a simple bug bite. Sadly, lower class minority and elderly. Everyone tried very hard to convince her, but even her family stopped trying, and she just wasted away as that cancer grew. Story 39. Vet nurse here. So it amazes me still how many people think that their dogs and cats are female when they are male and vice versa. It usually starts with an admit, I can clearly see a banana and or huge balls, and I look at the chart and it says the animal's name is Chloe, so it goes like this. Me, is this Chloe or another dog? Oh. No, this is Chloe. We've had her six months now, and we're worried about the fact she's lifting her hind leg when she pees. Me. Is she lifting her leg when she walks or moves, or is it just when peeing? Oh, no, just peeing. We're actually really worried about her. It's been going on since a couple of weeks after we got her. Me. Eh, well, that's probably because she is a heat. Oh, no, she's definitely a girl. Me. No, see this? That's a banana. And see those? They are testicles. Oh, blank look. Me. We should probably have a chat about taking those testicles off and changing his name. That was an actual conversation I had last week. Owner was not happy. Also, about a month ago, I had a male cat come in for swollen abdomen. Turns out he was as she and she was pregnant. The father was her full brother. The owner thought the humping in front of the TV at night was a dominance thing between two brothers. Story 40. As a midwife, I've had some doozies. When taking a patient's history at the start of pregnancy, I've been informed of some wild allergies. One patient claimed she was allergic to epinephrine because the one time she had it, it made her heart race. She couldn't tell me what the actual allergy that necessitated the epinephrine administration was. Another said she had an allergy to all opiates, as well as diamond hydronate and diphenhydramine because they made her sleepy. I've had a number of patients page me in a panic, worried that their water has broken. 
On further inquiry, I determined that they've just had intercourse and it's semen. Not sure how they got pregnant without knowing that was a thing. I've also had more than one pregnant person ask me if they are allowed to have a bowel movement near the end of pregnancy or if it will give the baby an infection. Yikes. Story 41. This was circa 1983. I'm a nurse. Retired. Had this one guy in his early 20s that went swimming hammered in a notoriously nasty lake in our area, like a don't-drink-the-water kind of lake, without shoes, stepped on an old beer tab and cut his foot open. Didn't go to the hospital or try to clean it at all for about a week. His GF said he kept saying, it's fine, it's just a cut, when she pressured him to get it seen about. So OFC, he shows up in the ER with a foot that blew up like a balloon. 2.5 months in the hospital. Foot completely laid open in surgery. Doing debridement and packing on this foot, which I can honestly say after over 30 years in healthcare stands is one of the nastiest jobs I ever had to do. And I had been dealing with things like bed sores and open wounds from radiation treatments and cancer for about seven years at that point. Add to this, he was obnoxious, abusive, and when the opportunity presented itself, cruel. Other nurses, you know the type, they're everywhere. Hopefully not as open about it these days, but yeah. I had a student nurse I was training that came running out of the room in tears and refused to go back in and would not tell any of us what he said, but I can imagine. Finally get it cleaned out, responding well to antibiotics. Tissue is granulating well. He gets sent home with antibiotics and strict instructions on how to care for it and to keep it clean and dry. The day he left the hospital, he went back out to the same lake, got drunk, put on nasty tennis shoes, and went swimming. Showed up on our floor again a week after being discharged. He lost the foot. His girlfriend left him. Story 42. Just got reminded of the time I got a highest priority call to someone who was actively choking. Rushed to scene. Going through the protocols en route. Plans for if we needed to perform CPR. Pull up. Rush in. Dude sat on the sofa, fully alert. Not choking. Uh, you've managed to clear it. Great. Me. No, I'm still choking. Them said with no hint of choking. Also, if your airway is occluded, you can't speak. Story is, he'd been to local carvery for lunch ate a big bit of beef that he felt was too big to swallow. But swallowed anyway. After a short while, he felt it was still not fully descended to his stomach, so he drove himself home and called 999. I explained that it was a large bolus of food in his, for simpleton speak, food pipe, not his air pipe. He needed to drink water to wash down and next time either cut into smaller pieces or not swallow. He had two young children and a third on its way. These people are allowed to vote, drive, and reproduce. Femel. Story 43? That's most patients. Honestly, they usually get that far through some combination of luck, bordering on divine intervention for some, endless enabling from family members and access to emergency care and social services enabling them to continue. I had one in particular who was a blind alcoholic with Tourette's. He would drink until he collapsed in the road daily and was brought to the ER. Daily. He survived being run over by a bus and being buried in a snowbank with a body temp in the low 80s all to leave AMA to drink and collapse in the street all over again. Daily. After about a decade of that nonsense, a leg infection he refused to treat got him. Story 44. I'm a medical professional and have seen lots of dumb people. But we had a great one where a 80-something-year-old woman was in the ICU for an MI heart attack. And because she was acting odd, they did a talk screen that came back positive for candy. One of our docs went in the room to talk to her about it, and she loudly proclaimed, I only did it because my husband had some. Our doc told her that's not a good reason. A little later, her kids and grandkids, all probably 20 plus YO, came in to visit. And when they figured out what was going out, you just hear them yell, Grandma, I got a kick out of that one. Grandma living her best life. Another time when I was in college, we were all hanging out in a dorm room smoking candy with a bunch of people when a friend falls and starts having a seizure. No history of it. So we called 911 and the ambulance wanted someone to ride along with him. So I went. He was post-ictal, hazy from after seizure. And when they were questioning him in the ED, they said, ED. So I understand you've consumed some marijuana tonight, friend. Yes, sir, E.D. How much? Friend, 20 per G. I proceeded to cry laughing, and the staff was completely confused, not understanding what he meant. Finally, I told my friend they weren't looking to pick up after work. They want to know how much you smoked. Once the staff realized they got a kick out of it, too. Maybe not totally in line with the prompt, but the last one is one of my favorite medical stories while not working at the hospital. Story 45. I went to a 911 call for sunburns at 2 a.m. This man had called at 9 p.m. but waited hours for us to show up. It was appropriately assigned the lower priority and got bumped by basically every other call all night long. So we showed up. I walk in and see this man sitting on the floor of his living room, looking completely distraught. I also what happened, he explains. He has a sunburn on his shoulder from being at a local water park earlier in the day. He says his pain is too tense. His skin has a slight redness to the upper shoulders and has no blisters at this time. 
After what feels like pulling teeth, I managed to find out that he applied sunscreen once, but did not reapply because I don't need it. Contextually, he seemed to be implying that his skin tone meant he wouldn't burn, and he has tried nothing for cooling the burn since he got home. All he has done is sit on the floor with his shirt off and make his wife get things for him. At this point, my primary differential diagnosis is that this is a man-child who has never had a sunburn, and I feel bad for his wife. But then she asks me if they can apply yogurt to it, so I explained about aloe vera, suggested they get some and keep it dot in the fridge, and then ask if he wants to come to the hospital. You know, the thing that I might expect you want to do when you call 911 for paramedics, the people that take you to the hospital. He asks how they're going to help, not if, not what they could do, but how. I explained that Emerge is likely not going to have much to offer beyond the Tylenol and Advil I've already offered, and he's refused, and then telling him to rest until it feels better, which I've already said. I also told him that they were going to expect him to wear a shirt in the waiting room, where he would be going directly, like he would be walking from the ambulance to the main waiting room. Since he met the fit to sit criteria, this was not going to be wasting the charge nurse's time. He ended up staying home. And timing-wise, it worked out well for me, since I was working an OT, 15 o'clock to 3 o'clock shift. Story 46. I had a patient who had a bullet lodged in her leg. We had the surgeon come and assess her. Based on its placement, he suggested leaving it because removing it could cause even more serious danger. We discharged her. She immediately walked to the ER in the same hospital to complain of leg pain. She had prescriptions and wound supplies in her hand. They brought her back, discovered the bullet wound, and called for a surgical consult. The exact same surgeon was on call and came to assess her. Guess what? Same suggestion to leave it. We educated her extensively about never getting an MRI or the bullet will fly out of her skin. She returns a few months later at a sister hospital complaining of a headache. Admitted inpatient, and you guessed it, they did an MRI. The bullet ripped out and the MRI machine was down for almost a week. Story 47. I've had a cow ton of them, but I think one of my favorites was a patient that came in with chest pain. Dude had three prior heart attacks, a pulmonary embolism, and a stroke over the past decade. I started an IV and was trying to draw his blood, but it was just not coming out. It was like syrup. I flushed the line repeatedly and just could not get anything, even though it was a fairly decent size IV, 18G if you know it. While I'm getting his blood, I'm asking about his current symptoms and his history. I ask if he takes blood thinners, and he said he has a prescription but doesn't take them when I asked why he says, I cow you not. I didn't want my blood to get flat. So no flipping wonder he's had clots to all of his major organs. Story 48. I'm not a doctor, but I play one on TV. I worked for three months as a secretary in a urological clinic. I was regaled with a story about a middle-aged man with a severe perineal and scrotal rash. Guy tried so many creams, his PCP at one point prescribed steroids, and it's just getting worse. It was a toss-up between a urologist and a dermatologist, and he could see a urologist sooner. The day he finally comes into our office, and when he takes off his drawers, he apparently smells like a wet fart. Turns out this guy was barely wiping his peach, and the swamp peach mixture he was brewing between his booty cheeks was getting worked forward as he walked throughout the day, and bathing his perineum in the back of his scrotum with poor sweat, leading to an out-of-control, blistering, oozing rash.